Professor Challenger, The Disintegration Machine by Arthur Conan Doyle, dramatized by Robert Lloyd Parry. Negotiation has passed. Josh, let right. me go! Oh. Jones, I don't remember summoning you. <sighs> Professor, what the devil? I, I heard screaming. There was a woman screaming. Oh, calm down, man. But calm Professor. down. Professor, it was only my wife. Your wife? What happened to her? She was nagging me. What? Where is she? On the stool of penance. Hello, Mr. Jones. Uh, how did you get up there? He put me here. You're a horrible, horrible bully, George Challenger. I don't understand. It is the stool of penance. The lower half, the stem, is a totem pole from Maple Whiteland, the finest Paraguayan teak. The seat is from an Indian howdah, adapted specially to accommodate my wife when she misbehaves. It is nine feet off the ground. She is five foot one. She shall not make it safely down until I help her. Professor, let her down. Good heavens. Yes, let me down, you horrible bully. Yes, in good time, my love, in good time. You know the drill. You're too late to save my wife, I'm afraid, Jones, but your arrival is nonetheless timely. Come through here. George, pas tous les sons. Je n'oublierai... I have received an unsolicited letter from on high. It seems that His Majesty's government does not think that the paying of her exorbitant taxes is burden enough upon the country's leading scientific thinker. Not content with listening in on my telephone conversations and reading my mail, no less a personage than the Minister for Secret Affairs now requests to see me in person. Read this. I don't need to, Professor. I've received the same summons. Oh? I'm on my way there now. I think it's about the world screen, Professor. Yes, well, I have drafted a reply declining the invitation. I'm engaged today in answering that buffoon Matt Zotti, whose views upon the larval development of the tropical termites have excited my derision and contempt. And I cannot afford the uh, time Professor, to go I don't off. think that we have a choice. Of course we have a choice, Jones. We are men of the Enlightenment. No. We are defined by our free will. No, I mean the ministers here. What? Here. Outside your front door. Here? There was a car waiting for me as I left the house this morning. A big black car with dark windows. A man in uniform, I couldn't tell whether it was a chauffeur or a policeman, but I think he was armed, invited me to get in and brought me over here. The car just dropped me outside to fetch you. The minister's in the back, Professor. He wants a word with us. The minister? Here, you say? Well, I didn't actually see him. I was made to sit in the front, but there was someone in the back... I could smell his cologne. And they've sent a car. A big black car. I've never seen anything quite like it. Yes, well, it, it is a cheerful summer's day. A, a motoring trip to Whitehall might be a pleasant diversion. But Zotti will still be an imbecile when I get back. Josh? Josh, I am getting cramped. This was never funny in the first place. Uh, yes, my dear, I quite agree. It is no laughing matter. Now, I am just going out, dear. Shan't be much longer than an hour. George, don't you dare leave me up here. You are the worst of Bruce. Do not leave. Do not walk out of that door. I mean it. I must say I'm glad you're here to accompany me, Jones. People have been known to vanish without a trace when answering such summons. <laughs> Professor, this is England. I'm sure. Without a trace, Jones. Professor Challenger. Who is that? Please, get in, Professor. So, Jones, you go in the front with Jacob. So, Professor Challenger, I, I can't tell you what a very great pleasure it is to finally meet one of our greatest living scientists. But why these invidious qualifications? What? Perhaps you could name these other sages to whom you impute equality with me. 
Or do you mean that they are superior? I'm sorry, perhaps I worded that badly. My dear minister, do not imagine that I am exacting, but surrounded as I am by pugnacious and unreasonable colleagues, one is forced to take one's own part. I understand. Right, come now, what is the reason for this summons? I have papers to write, errors to correct. Very well, Professor. Now tell me, does the name Theodore Nemor mean anything to you? Nemor. Nemor. Until recently he held... A... Nemor, yes, of course, a physicist and well-known charlatan. A Latvian, I believe. He is a double Nobel laureate. As I say, a well-known charlatan. He has since, I believe, settled into a richly deserved obscurity. Ah, yes, well, no. You see, he's turned up again. Really? In London. I see. Hampstead, to be precise. Ooh, lucky Mr. Nemo. Working as a dentist. <laughs> it seems that he has come up with an invention, a rather extraordinary one. Let me guess, an edible gum shield. <laughs> no. An electric toothbrush. <laughs> no, 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 though it is a machine, and I imagine that electricity must play a role in its operation. Revolutionary. He calls it the Nemo Disintegrator. And it is designed, and I'm quoting a confidential dossier here, to disintegrate any object placed within its sphere of influence. Absurd. Well, the claim does sound extravagant, I agree, and yet I have reliable intelligence that suggests that the man has indeed stumbled upon something rather remarkable. Minister, we've all seen this before with Doomkopf's telepomp, of which this sounds like a cheap derivative, and every bit is doomed to failure. It may be pretty significant. It came to our attention because our Russian counterparts have been paying him several visits recently. Oh, perhaps they are finally doing something about their sickening dental hygiene. Please, Professor Challenger, you must understand that for reasons social and political, we are keen to get to the bottom of the affair. Now, all I ask is that you call upon Nemor, inspect his invention, and then give me your expert opinion. Impossible! I have better things to do than puncture the overinflated fantasies of some Eastern European prestidigitator. You're clearly unaware of Matt Zotti's claims in the latest journal of parasitic entomology. You simply forget, Which... Professor Challenger, that you and Mr. Jones are beholden to His Majesty's government. I don't know what you mean. Well, I do not need to remind you of the considerable reparations we had to pay after your experiment last year at Hengist Down. It was a private experiment that I paid for and conducted myself. A private experiment with very public consequences, Professor. When your pet cormorant plunged into the nerve ganglion of old Mother Earth, well, it had international repercussions. I shall not go into details, but you and Mr. Jones, as I believe the phrase goes, owe us one. I am no pawn of the state. Professor! I am no pawn of the state. Do you know what these are, Professor Challenger? I should say they're a set of very old and rusty keys. Keys? Which grant the holder access to a certain area of the Tower of London. You wouldn't imprison me. Professor Challenger, please believe me that I am in earnest when I say that I have colleagues in Whitehall, powerful colleagues, who are agitating to do precisely that. And you think Nemor is simply going to show us his machine if we turn up at his son? Oh, you are too modest, Professor. Surely the name Challenger is enough to open any self-respecting laboratory door on the planet. No? I am no pawn of the state. Professor, if I ask Jacobs to turn left here, he will take the road to Hampstead. If I ask him to carry straight on, we will soon be at the tower. And which is it to be? So, you must pretend that you have the toothache and are in need of a dentist. That way we can catch him off guard. But why are you here? What do you mean? Well, if I've come to the dentist with the toothache, why are you here? Good point. You must be an imbecile. What? Yes, you are an imbecile with the toothache, and I am your friend, a sort of good Samaritan figure who has accompanied you to the dentist. Professor! And that way, while he's examining your mouth, I can see what's really going I'm on. I'm not going to have some fake dentist... Just keep him occupied while I go through the I, house. I really don't like this, Professor. Remember, this is government business, Jones. Professor, I'm not going to have my mouth interfered with. Silence, Jones. Remember, you're an imbecile. Act like one. Yes, may I help you? Ah, uh, uh, yes, yes. Good day. Yes, uh, I have come to consult the dentist. Professor uh, Challenger? Uh, what? Uh, no. The Professor George Edward Challenger? Uh, no, I've come to see the dentist about the crusade. Author of the underlying fallacy of Weismanism. Scourge of the Royal Zoological Society. Uh, no, look. This is the very same. <sighs> Professor Challenger, I am so proud. Theodore Nemo, I am a great admirer of your work. I am flattered that you recognize me, sir. 
Professor Challenger. But of course I recognize you. You have a European name, sir. And an unforgettable face. Come in, come in. Your friend too. Let us see what we can do for you both. Thank you. Now, who's first? <laughs> <laughs> I trust you will forgive my incognito. I did once practice dentistry as a child, but gave it up long ago. I do, however, find that it is a useful cover for my more serious activities, which must perforce to be somewhat more secretive. I'm sure you can appreciate that. Sit down, Professor, please. Thank you. Make yourself comfortable. And perhaps your friend would sit in the dentist's chair. <laughs> I'm sorry, I missed your name. Jones. Peerless Jones. Sit down, Mr. Jones. A mere stage prop, you understand. I shan't submit you to an oral examination. Unless... Uh, no. No. Thank you. Please, make yourself comfortable. Well, gentlemen. May I ask whether you represent the British government? <laughs> How dare you? George Edward Challenger is no pawn of the state. Ah, then you've not come about my machine. The Nemeral Disintegrator holds no interest for you? Hmm, pity. I was rather hoping that... Well, what then shall we talk about? Well, first of all, I need to convince myself that there is actually anything to talk about. Aha. Uh -huh. I have a reputation to sustain, Nemeral. You must show me your proofs before I can seriously consider your claims. Caution is, of course, one of the great scientific virtues. So, yes, I am prepared to give you the proofs you ask for. I shall be very interested to see them. Perhaps an actual demonstration of the machine in action? That would be a start. Where is it? Your friend over there. Mr. Smith, isn't it? Jones? Jones, of course. Bon voyage, Mr. Jones. <laughs> Where did he go? Aha! That is an excellent question, Professor. Where indeed did Mr. Jones go? I call it, in all modesty, the Nemorosphere. But, but how? This is no ordinary dentist chair, Professor. And this, well, it is a very simple remote control device. You will understand, I am sure, if I decline to go into details. You mean... That he has been disintegrated. Impossible! Depend upon it, Professor, please. You asked for proof. Here is proof. This is nothing but a conjuring trick. Smoke and mirrors and you, sir, are a bad music hall term. A conjuring trick? Look, Challenger, look! The mist! The dry vapour! Use your eyes! Your Jones is not yet fully dispersed. No! Don't touch it. Good God! Yes, indeed. You are witnessing a miracle, face to face. Could a music hall magician do this? You've killed my Jones! Not killed. Disintegrated. It's Dumkopf all over again. You'll pay for this, Nemor. <laughs> Dumkopf was a kindergarten ass who did not understand even the most basic principles of what he was dealing with. He was undone by the failure of a battery. But how the devil... The theory is quite straightforward. Consider, when certain crystals are placed in water, salt, for example, or the sugar in your tea, they dissolve and disappear. Then, by evaporation or otherwise, if you lessen the amount of the water, lo... There are your crystals again. Conceive a like process by which Jones has been dissolved into the cosmos. By a subtle reversal of the conditions, he can, like salt or sugar crystals, be reassembled once more. The analogy is nonsensical. Even if I accept that our molecules could be dispersed by some disrupting power emitted from a dentist's lamp, for God's sake, why should they reassemble in exactly the same order as before? You've killed my friend. Your objection is an obvious one, but I can only answer that there is an invisible framework and every brick flies back into place, more or less. Behold! What? What have you done to him? Calm down, Professor. I believe he's talking backwards. It's all over, Mr. Jones. 
You responded admirably. How do you feel? He interfered with it. No, ma'am, he interfered with it. He's fine, you see. There's been a, well, misplacement on his return. It happens occasionally. His speech will correct itself over time. Perhaps. But he's exactly where he was before you vanished him and still in that absurd chair. At least Dumkov managed to transport his head from one room to another. What have you achieved? What good is a transportation machine if it doesn't transport? Certainly I could have spent my time on that. There would be no real difficulty, I don't think, in my disintegrating you here and reassembling you on the banks of the Ganges, for instance. You might fit in rather nicely there. In fact, would you like a little jaunt? I'm more than happy to demonstrate upon your own body the capabilities of the new force. If you have the courage to submit to it... Your if, sir, is in the highest degree offensive. Then please, take your seat. You see, your friend Jones highly recommends an excursion into the ether. Although he doubts whether you have the mental strength to cope with the experience. I dare do all that may become a man. Move aside, Jones. Let's have a run. Aside, I say. I am ready. Run. Let's have a <laughs> Well done, Professor. Well done, indeed. <laughs> it is an interesting process, is it not, Mr. Jones? <sighs> it is strange to think that he is right now a molecular cloud suspended somewhere within this room, no? Let me out. Let me back. Let me in, Neville. I'll do anything in the name of heaven. Let me back. By the way, you can tell your friends in Whitehall, Mr. Jones, that the British government has lost its chance. I don't know what the hell you're talking about. It's no use denying it. You stink of the Foreign Office. I was prepared to sell the disintegrator to the first bidder who approached me with a decent price. If it has now fallen into the hands of which your government disapproves, you have only yourselves to blame. Oh, then you have sold the machine. I have sold the idea of the machine. And at a very good price. Unique knowledge is a very valuable commodity, Mr. Jones. And I am the only one who knows how to manufacture the device. And the gentleman to whom you've sold it. I am not so foolish as to hand over the knowledge until the money is paid. Nor so careless as to commit anything to paper. It is my head, if you like, that is for sale. I suspect that the name Nemor may be upon the world's lips for some time to come. I wonder if your Professor Challenger shall be around to utter it. It would be a shame indeed, would it not, if so eminent a figure as the Professor should miss the revolution? You bring him out, Nemo, or I swear... What do you swear, Jones? That you will beat me to a pulp? That you will kill me? You would be condemning your master to an eternity in a Nemorosphere. We dog! There is not, as far as I can tell, the possibility of death in the Nemorosphere. If I were to leave him there, I would at least be conferring upon Professor Challenger the immortality he so wretchedly craves. <sighs> Oh, Mr. Jones, you don't seriously believe I would leave him there? No. I have a curious little discovery I wish to share with him. I have discovered that the hair of the human body is on an entirely different vibration to the living organic tissues. As such, it can be included or excluded at will during the reconstitution process. It would interest me very much to see the bear without his bristles. Would that interest you too? No, it would not. Nevertheless, Behold him. <laughs> My God, it's horrible. Well, I'm sorry, Professor. <laughs> what are you laughing at? Did you enjoy your little excursion, Professor? A little cold, is it not? Oh, oh, where's my hair? My beard? What have you done? Professor, hold it. <laughs> Something, as I explained before, is sometimes lost in the reconstitution process. In your case, all the hair on your chinny-chin-chin. Chin. Quite the ugly little lady, is he not, Mr. Jones? You have taken a liberty, sir, which is likely to have very serious consequences to yourself. Look upon it as a fresh start. An unexpected return to your not-so-gilded youth. Embrace change, Professor Challenger. <laughs> Let go of him now and put your hands in the air. Let go of him, I said. Svetlana, come in, come in. You have arrived just in time. What's going on? Are you all right, Doctor? Who are these men? Yes, of course. Introductions. Svetlana, meet Professor George Edward Challenger, the eminent British scientist. 
but perhaps you don't recognize him without his voluminous whiskers. <laughs> and this is his friend. I'm sorry, I've forgotten your name. Smith, Brown, Peerless Jones. Of course. Now, Svetlana, I don't think the gun is necessary. The professor was merely expressing his frustration at another success. I could shoot them now, if you like. No, no, that won't be necessary. You gentlemen don't mind, do you, if Svetlana and I talk business for some moments? Yeah, Have you bought the money? Here. Count it, if you like. Oh, don't worry. I will. We travel tonight. A car will pick you up in one hour. I shall be here. Goodbye, Svetlana. Beautiful woman, don't you think, gentlemen? Such a shame about the feet. And what are those Russians going to do with your ridiculous dentist's chair anyway, Nemor? With the chair? Absolutely nothing. No, no, his Britannic Majesty can keep the chair. What you have witnessed today, this is just a model. Child's play, really. Under my direction, it shall not be difficult to construct devices upon a much larger scale. Uh, what does he mean, Professor? Well... Let us suppose that one part of the machine was in a vessel on the sea and the other in another. A battleship caught between them could be made to simply vanish at the flick of a switch. The hands which did not fear to wield this weapon, well, the possibilities are limitless, Professor. Why, I could imagine the whole Thames Valley being swept clean and not one man, woman or child left of these teeming millions. And you have sold the secret as a monopoly to Russia? Well, let us see what is in this suitcase that Svetlana has so kindly brought along. Aha, yes. Do you think it vulgar of me to have asked for payment in cash, Professor? I must admit I have never seen four million dollars before, but I always imagined it would look something like this. You dog. You'll never get away with it. Oh, do not be so censorious, Mr. Jones, really. I am merely a scientist. A wise man once said, Science seeks knowledge. Let the knowledge lead us where it will. We still must seek it. Now, who was that? A famous British scientist, I believe. Mm. Ah, yes. Mm. Professor Challenger. Mm. It was you. Mm. Now, can you blame me if I accept a large capital sum for my life's work? No. Professor. Oh, silence, Jones. The time for a yapping is over. The time for applause has arrived, however grudging. I undervalued you, Nemo. You are that rare thing, an authentic visionary. You are too kind, Professor. That rare combination of boundless imagination and mathematical precision that I had for so long cherished in myself, I see that compared to you... Oh, well, I am ashamed. Really? You shouldn't. And to think that I was about to beat you to a pulp. <laughs> I disgust myself. It is enough to your credit that you alone should have been the first to come upon so remarkable a property of nature, but to have succeeded in harnessing it for the use of man, that is truly remarkable. Professor! I said silence, you imbecile. Are you never silent? Science must be dispassionate. It is our duty, but to follow knowledge wherever it may lead. Precisely. But never, I mean doctor, professor, rabbi, I am full of questions. I am ready to answer anything, mm. save what the source of the power is. And you really accomplished this, this, this miracle of invention on your own. Surely you had a team of assistants. I work alone. Truly remarkable. You've no objection, I suppose, to, to my examining the construction of the machine. None in the least. That is merely the body. It is the soul of it. The animating principle which you can never hope to capture. Quite so, but the, the mere mechanism itself seems to me to be a model of ingenuity. Might I... might I sit in the chair again? Would you like another excursion into the Nemorosphere, Professor? Perhaps you might rediscover your hair. <laughs> <laughs> Quite, yes, indeed, I should like that very much. But later, perhaps. Later, no. But for now, I just wanted to check. Yes, I thought so, I... You know, I don't suppose it matters. What? Well, uh, no doubt you know already. I mean, it's, it's a quite trivial flaw. What do you mean? The small leakage. Electrical, I suppose. It, it, it clearly doesn't matter. I mean, it's inevitable that in such a tremendous piece of machinery some small things might be overlooked. Impossible. It is quite insulated. Well, but I assure you that I feel it. There. I have tested it many times, Professor. Oh, credit me with some scientific gumption, man. I'm sorry, but no, I, I, I can distinctly feel a faint electronic vibration. Where? Just around here, as I sit in the chair. Here, 
see. Where? Just under my left buttock. Look, no, no. just would you sit there? Here, try it. I can feel nothing. There isn't a, a faint tingling in your left buttock? No, sir, not a thing. I told you it is entirely safe. Oh, and now... Dear, I'm sorry, I seem to have inadvertently touched the remote control device. Rats! One is, I suppose, liable to have awkward incidents with a rough model of this kind. This device should certainly be carefully guarded, Nemor. Nemor? Where are you? Oh, good heavens. I was so excited when he brought you back, Jones, that I did not see which was the proper button for the return. Did you notice it? I think it was the red one, the one at the top. Oh, dear, George, I still cannot understand a word you are saying. Oh, too bad, too bad. There are so many buttons and we do not know their purpose. We may make the matter worse if we experiment with the unknown. Perhaps it is better to leave matters as they are. And you would... Yes, it is better so, I think. The interesting personality of Mr. Theodore Nemort has distributed itself throughout the cosmos. His machine is worthless, and a certain foreign government has been deprived of knowledge by which much harm might have been wrought. Oh, and he's left his suitcase. Not a bad morning's work, as it turns out, Jones. I have rather enjoyed the experience, all told, but life has its duties as well as its pleasures, and I must now return to the Italian Mazzotti and his preposterous views upon the larval development of the tropical termites. But surely the first duty of the law-abiding citizen is to prevent murder. I have done so. But, Professor, you can't simply leave him there. It's... Well, it's horrible, isn't it? It was, I admit, rather unsettling in the Nemorosphere. <laughs> I like the name, Nemorosphere. Yes, yes, we shall let that stand. Did you see the lion-headed giantess, her body wrapped with snake? Oh. Yes. <laughs> let us speak no more of it. Our revels now are ended, and these our actors are melted into air, into thin air. Come back for lunch, Jones. We have a new cook whose omelettes are excelled only by her cauliflower cheese. And it is probably time that I took my wife down from the stool of penance. She shall be tired of the joke by now. <laughs> I wonder if she'll notice that my beard has gone. She might rather like the new look. I suppose I ought to buy her some flowers or something. Feeling that a box. Oh, God, the for the love of the beast. Challenger! In Arthur Conan Doyle's The Disintegration Machine, dramatised by Robert Lloyd Parry, Professor Challenger was played by Bill Patterson and Peerless Jones by Gunnar Cawthry. Nemor was played by Nick Ball and the Minister of Secret Affairs by Robert Lloyd Parry. Mrs. Challenger was played by Joanna Monroe and Svetlana by Alexandra Everett. Professor Challenger, The Disintegration Machine, was directed in Birmingham by Fiona Kelcher.